there are some kinks that really need to be worked out. Um, I have a, a little box up here that indicates I am still live. Oh, no, maybe I'm going live and no, I'm still live. Uh, let's see. I'm. Let me see if I can get someone on the phone here to. Oh, there. Okay, there we go. There we go. There we go. This this is a this is a new facilitating platform Salam Media is using, and uh, it's got clearly there's some kinks that need to be wor worked out. Well, with this, it's. Um, but you, but you were you were you were saying uh, fi finish your thought, uh, please, Sister Lena. Where did you uh, where did you hear up to? I should ask. Um. I was just saying that um, my parents, um, they sort of, they, they showed us the example of how to fight back, of how to uh, to, to tell your case and to do, fight for your rights. So, um, and I was blessed, subhanAllah, I mean, it was a difficult time what happened uh, with my uncle, but it was through that example that we had this unique experience that enabled us to create this campaign to advocate for my dad and his co-defendants. So that was something that, um, you know, we try to pass on to other family members who for the first, you know, their their experience against the might of the U.S. government is their first experience. But um, unfortunately, it wasn't our first rodeo when it happened to my dad. So, um, but um, so I, I give my parents credit for the example that they they left for us. So, and, and of course, my mom continued that, you know, first with her brother and then her husband. I agree. I, I, I give tremendous credit to your family as well, your mother and father. Um, and, you know, clearly that adage, the fruit, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree is, is appropriate here. Alhamdulillah. Um, and you are always you there. Know, and I, I want to say that to the audience that you are always there. I mean, unfailing. Alhamdulillah. 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 Dr. Sami Al Arian, Lena just reminded me of of your of of your relative, Dr. Uh, Mazen Al Najjar. Mm -hmm. I remember him well. I remember the case well. I remember your your advocacy for him uh, well. And I also remember, brother, thinking after they went after you, after he was finally freed, and they went after, they came out, in fact, he was freed, and then he was deported, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then they came after you. My thought was, and Allah knows best. I don't know if you're if you feel the same way, but my thought was then and now that you were always the target. You were always the target. Your your case, uh, the the case of Dr. Mezen Al Najjar and and Dr. Samuel Arian, re, it, it reminds me of the case of um, of of the um, uh, the so-called Virginia Jihad Network case and Dr. Ali Al-Tamimi. My belief was Dr. Ali Al-Tamimi was always the target, but they decided to go after what they considered to be his students, his, his partisans who looked up to him, who learned from him. They, go, they went after him first, after them first, and then after they successfully did what they wanted to them, it, it made it easier for them to get the person that they really wanted. That's That was my thought with that case and with your case as well, that you were always the target because you were one of the most, you were one of the most prominent Muslims in the country in terms of influence, in terms of face, in terms of voice. I mean, you were one of the most prominent, you had one of, one of the most, uh, you had one of the, the strongest Muslim voices in the country. And you were also, by virtue of, of being that kind of, of, of influence, you, you were breaking down walls and you were, you were effecting alliances in places that made the powers that be very uncomfortable. And so they had to come after you. Um, 
that's how I saw it. Your thoughts? I think, first of all, thank you so much for your kind words, brother. Uh, I mean, they admitted it. I mean, they went to Mazin and they told him that uh, he is the target, that if he has any, anything on me, that he will be rewarded. And of course, he had nothing. Uh, but I think it, there is a larger picture here. It, it's uh, maybe maybe I was active and and I uh, I ruffled some uh, feathers, and a lot of people didn't like what we were doing, especially you know a lot of Zionists uh, in the country, and right. especially that you know a tenured professor. A lot of people thought that they can get me through that, and they failed miserably. They tried with the university uh, before mm -hmm. 9 11, I should add, and they were not able or successful to uh, get me fired. And then we were instrumental, you know, even after they they arrested uh, Dr. Mazin and Najjar, we were able actually through uh, collective efforts. Yes, we, we, our family, and I give a lot of credit uh, to my wife and to a lot of other people who, who worked hard, some Muslim, some non-Muslim. You remember Kate Gage and you remember David Cole and you remember mm -hmm. many others who came. Uh, we were able to assemble over 40 organizations, some Irish, and some you know civil rights and others and we were able to get them all together working to repeal the the secret evidence we started with with a media campaign and we were we were able to get over 50 editorials and over 200 feature stories we were able to go through uh public education and we had we had uh, uh panels around the country uh, we were able to go then politically and go to congress we fought very hard uh, legally speaking we were able to get some judges on our side we were able to free everybody who was out unless they were deported before we got to them. Uh, the last one to be freed was Mazin. I mean, we had 29 cases, 28 of which were Muslims, a lot of them Arabs and Palestinians, and a few of them were deported, but we were able to get each and every one of them because we fought back and we fought back hard. Even when we got 13 churches along with our mosque to meet with the Justice Department, uh, back in April 1998, and they met with the, uh, at the time was the, uh, the deputy uh, attorney general, uh, Eric uh, Holder. Uh, we were able to meet with his staff and they stopped the practice. And the way they stopped it is that they said, we realize that this is a problem. They use a secret evidence. We can't uh, stop it. But what we're going to do is to put that decision in the hands of the attorney general, Janet Reno at the time, or her deputy. Luckily, we were, we were facing one case a month. After that meeting and after the decision in July of 1998, not a single case was approved. So we knew that we stopped the bleeding. The next was how we can get our brothers out of prison and then how we can repeal it. So we were able to go fight uh, in the courts and we were able to get everybody. The last one was Mazin in, in December of 2000. And then we went through Congress and we were able to introduce a bill. And you were part of that, brother. You know that uh, when we had what we called the Secret Evidence Summit, 700 people were uh, meeting on standing room only. We had all kinds of senators and, and Congress people. I, I remember the second ranking Democrat, <laughs> David Bonnier was in, was in that meeting and he told me he was so impressed. He, he said to me at the time, this is the largest crowd that has ever been to Congress outside the, the well of the house. He's never seen something like that. And from I that- I remember moment, it well. Yeah, we had 129, 129 Congress people signing to this legislation that only benefited Arabs and Muslims, unprecedented at the time. And then we went through the uh, Judiciary Committee members one by one, trying to convince them. We got at the time, you know, very famous, uh, uh, the head of the Judiciary Committee, uh, the guy from um, uh, uh, Henry Hyde from Chicago. You know, I went to our community in Chicago and we were able to talk to him and, and, and deal with him and, and he signed on. And then he took it from the subcommittee the guy who was who was chairing that subcommittee was 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 an Islamophobe, anti-Muslim. He didn't do anything about it. He took it from his. Uh, he took that legislation from him, put it in the hands of the chairman, and then he scheduled a markup, and we won 26 to two. When we had the hearing, if you remember, on one side we had American Jewish Congress, American Jewish Committee, ADL, and Stephen Emerson, and on our yes, side, yes. you know, on our side we had David Cole and Greg Nujayam from ACLU and. Mm -hmm. and the victims uh, of secret evidence, including my wife, who I give a lot of credit to, uh, even after my, my arrest, she's the one who took the kids by her wing and, 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 and the family stayed as a family and they went on the offense. They didn't back out. They didn't shrink, as you say. And uh, they were able to go and fight back and, and reassemble this, this community of activists to speak the truth to power. And then after that, we got it 
almost passed because we had also aligned ourselves with other powerful people uh, in an election year. And if you remember, I mean, we uh, we were able to be so instrumental that the uh, the parties were 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 uh, racing to get our support for that particular close elections. And when one of the candidates on national TV before 62 million Americans said that I am against secret evidence. You know, this is an issue that people idea. thought that was so marginal that this is only mm -hmm. Muslims and Arabs. But here it is in the middle of the campaign, you know, before 62 million mm -hmm. Americans, he says he's against mm -hmm. secret evidence and he's for the for our bill to pass it in Congress. And on based on that alone, we gave him the the endorsement. And then, uh, you know, we, we campaigned in, in Florida based on that promise. And he won Florida by 537 votes. Then they recognized that this is this is that we were the, the reason, the catalyst for his win. They invited me back and they honored me. And none other than, of course, I'm not proud of that, but that's what happened. <laughs> you know, Newt Gingrich. <laughs> you know, I had Newt Gingrich and, and Tom Davis and John Sununu coming and thanking me for it. Then we said, all right, mm -hmm. we delivered, you should deliver. And they said, absolutely, we would de deliver. Then they put, uh, you know, John Ashcroft became the, the attorney general. So they studied the issue mm -hmm. of secret evidence. They called me in, in August and said, we've resolved it. We're going to ban it. And guess what? Every Muslim leader is invited to the White House to come and celebrate the end and the banning of secret evidence. I thought that would have been the 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 height, the peak of our victory. Unfortunately, that day was 9-11. Mm -hmm. Out of all the days, that day yeah. was 9-11. And even yeah. uh, Karl Rove, uh, in his memoir on page 325, I believe, he he did acknowledge that on that day, Bush was supposed to meet at three o'clock with the leader, uh, leaders of the Muslim community. He doesn't say why, but that's why they were going to repeal secret mm -hmm. evidence, an issue that we were working on since '97 for 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 uh, four years at the time, trying to get it repealed, and it was about to be repealed until something else happened. But it's an example of activism. It's an yes. example of of of, of uh, you know being at the forefront of issues. Uh, we thought that every community in the history of the United States has to win its civil rights battle before it gets empowered. And we thought that this was our civil rights battle because it's our people who were targeted. And we thought that this is a path towards the empowerment of our community because uh, uh, to, to, to survive in the US, you really have to have power. And when I say power, I don't mean it in the, in the negative sense or politically so that you can abuse it. You need power to preserve your rights. And because what happened after 9-11 and since, I mean, it's become much, much worse. And, you know, I pray for you every day of what the Muslim community has to face nowadays. But at the time, we thought that this is our way to, to empower our community, is that they need to wake up and start being a player in what's going on. You know, their rights will not be handed to them. You know, we, and we had many, many examples before. No community. Uh, was empowered until it stood up and defended its rights. And I think the African-American right. experience is a great right. testament for that. Brother. I think it's in that spirit that that's why we continue the work, because I, I always say the same thing my dad says, that no community ever got its rights by burying their heads in the sand. So, um, that's right. you know, yeah. it's, a, it's an important reminder, especially now more than ever, um, you know, during this this month um, during this time of reflection yeah it's 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 very important um brother sammy you i'm, I'm sure that the, the the audience that that much of the audience would uh be interested in knowing how it was you came to be where you are now in Turkey, how you came to be in Turkey. And uh, it, it just recently came to my attention, the organization that you uh, are, are the, the head of, you probably are the founder of, or at least one of the principal founders of. Um, why don't you share with us what you're doing in Turkey right now? First of all, how you came to be in Turkey and right. what you're doing there. Well, as you know, we went through my first trial and uh, they couldn't convict on a single charge they were asking for three life sentences right. and and uh, 220 years on top of that and of course they failed to convict on a single case so at the end they had to settle we had to settle where i would leave the country and I'd give up all my rights in change for dropping all the cases 
But and then they opened another case for me. And that case, of course, was uh, an attempt to, uh, to get another bite at the apple. Luckily, we had a very attentive judge who didn't buy that. So she put me on a house arrest, and she didn't want to rule in any of the motions until the government gave up. And what happened, actually, is the government gave up after uh, six years, from 2008 until 2014, when they realized that the judge is not going to rule ever on this, and I would be staying there. So in 2014, they asked the judge to uh, drop the case, which uh, the judge did. And then uh, I, at that time, I already gave up all my rights, you know, because of the agreement in 2006. So I was looking for a country which, you know, obviously as a Palestinian, because I am Palestinian, refugees with no country, no citizenship. I didn't have any country to go to. I wasn't a citizen of any country in the world. So uh, I was looking and um, uh, some friends of mine, uh, I didn't know that at the time, actually. They approached the president of Turkey, President Erdogan, who just been elected as president in 2014, came to the UN. Uh, uh, some of them are very prominent academics, even non-Muslim. They approached him about my case, and he said, and they told him about it, and he said, yeah, he would get very interested in it. And it happened that right after that meeting, he was meeting with the vice president at the time, Joe Biden, and he said, before we start, I, I want you to, uh, to, to give us this person, and he gave him the file. Two weeks later, he told him, you can have your Palestinian scholar. I'm told that was the, uh, what he told him. And I, all that was happening, even, you know, I didn't know anything about until the government uh, uh, contacted my lawyer and and they, they explained that uh, what's happening with my case, which I didn't know anything. And then, you know, we, we knew at the time that uh, Turkey has asked for me. And within a few weeks, I uh, I came here without any papers because, uh, you know, the, the, the government asked the, the Turks to give me any paper and they refused to give them any papers. So I was basically escorted without an ID even, all the way to the, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, to the plane, I mean, to the gates. And, and, and at the time, I, uh, you know, the guy told me, uh, um, you know, thank you very much and all that, you know, the, the, the agent, the uh, um, HHSA, the, the ICE agent, basically. And, you know, I said goodbye and went to the plane and came here. Now, about the organization, it's, you know, I, when I came here, uh, one of the uh, uh, rectors, one of the presidents of the university asked me to teach, which I said, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in a full-time teaching, but I'm interested to, uh, to establish a center, uh, a center that will research issues uh, of concern to the Muslim world at large and to, uh, and to, and to Turkey in particular. And they embraced the idea and they, uh, they uh, you know, they gave me the permission and we, we started this center. It's called Center for Islam and Global Affairs. Uh, you can go to our website and you can see some of our activities. We've had so far six conferences. Uh, we were about to have two more this month, but because of the pandemic, we had to postpone. But we had uh, we usually have one uh, in the fall. Uh, it's an Islamic uh, conference. It's it's an, a conference on uh, the Muslim Ummah, we call it, which is an intellectual conference talking about the different issues facing the Muslim world at large. And then we have one in the spring about Islamophobia. And here we try to focus on different forms of Islamophobia, the West, the East, in, in the Muslim world, even you know, by Muslims and others. And we also have a third one on Palestine. So we have about three conferences a year. We had dozens of uh, seminars. And this Ramadan, actually, we're having a lecture every day. Uh, we bring a scholar from around the world, uh, and we talk about different issue every day. And it's been very successful and very much uh, 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 you know, I'm looking forward actually to engage all these uh, scholars, and and it's been popular. Uh, we have several students who are doing their PhD and, under the center. You know, I have about uh, you know close to 20 students working in the center. Uh, some of them are doing PhDs and master's degrees, and others are in postdoc positions. So mm -hmm. we're very active on, on on many fronts. Uh, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Speaking of occupied Palestine. And this global uh, pandemic that uh, you know we're we're all dealing with right now, um, I'd, I'd like to 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 know what the, your sense of of the conditions are in occupied Palestine. In fact, I'd like to to hear from both of you. Uh, you want to we want to start out with you, sister Alina. Have have you been following events in occupied yeah. Palestine and especially in Gaza? What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, actually, my parents-in-law are here from Gaza, subhanAllah. They came to, you know, to have a nice visit, and then it turned into a global pandemic. And um, we've been grateful that they're here instead of there because they both have diabetes, they have high blood pressure, heart disease, and um, they're just all across the board almost considered the vulnerable um, people to the COVID-19. Um, so we've been following just from uh, relatives on the ground there. Um, you know, there was a case of some uh, Palestinians from Gaza who traveled to Pakistan for a conference and came back and they tested positive uh, for COVID-19 and they kept them, um, the government kept them at the border, just isolated and quarantined for a couple of weeks. Um, it seems that, um, you know, a, uh, you know a, a product, unfortunately, of long, you know, over a decade long siege, 14 years now in Gaza is their limited um, interaction with the outside world. Um, it, it so happened that um, COVID hasn't really spread there as we've seen in the West Bank. Um, of course, we still call on the U.S. government and Israel and the neighbors, neighboring countries to, you know, lift the siege on Gaza. Um, I want to add that, but um, in the West Bank, I see that the U.S., um, sorry, not the U.S., the Israeli military has been supporting settlers in stealing land. I mean, it's all still ongoing as people are grappling with this uh, pandemic there. Um, so I've been following the news like everyone else is reading um, headlines and articles out of uh, the region there. And unfortunately, even uh, a pandemic, a global pandemic, isn't enough to, uh, you know, at least temporarily halt um, the oppression of the Israeli occupation. Um, but I'm sure my father knows uh, in more detail the situation on the ground there. Yes, Dr. Samuel Larian. Yes. Your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> Palestinians are under occupation. What many people do not understand is that because the occupation has been there for so long, you know, for some it's been their lifetime. I mean, they were yeah. born under occupation, they were raised under occupation, they got married under occupation, they have children under occupation, and they will die under occupation. And it's very difficult for people to come to grips to what it means to be under occupation. It is modern day slavery. You know, to be totally, your life is totally controlled by an outsider who hates you and who wants you dead and he wants you to, uh, to fail and he wants you to, uh, to, to somehow uh, give up and leave. That's, that's the, the basic premise. Of a Zionist project in Palestine is to take the land and exile the people. So when you live all your life, you know, under occupation, it becomes uh, a, a, an untenable situation. And now add to that a pandemic, where you know you you are threatened not just be in in your livelihood, but you're threatened. You know, your your freedom is curtailed, and then you're threatened with death if you get to that. Uh, today, in the Palestinian territories, you have you know in, in Israel, you know, you have about over sixteen thousand cases. Uh, in the occupied territories, you don't have the same level of testing. So we can't tell for sure if these are real numbers because they don't get the same medical facilities, the same medical care, you know, the, the, the same level of testing. They don't get any of that. But there are about 550 confirmed cases. Over two thirds of them are in Jerusalem because there is more contact between Palestinians and Israelis in the greater area of Jerusalem, unlike the other uh, cities which are in lockdown anyway. I mean, they, uh, they are in lockdowns uh, throughout throughout the year, not, not just because of the pandemic. I mean, Gaza has been under siege now for almost 14 years, continuously. Not a single day goes by without, you know, being totally under total lockdown. So it's very difficult. But the, the, the real concern with many Palestinians are the people in prison. We have 5,000 Palestinians, 5,000 Palestinians in prison. All of them are political prisoners. None are criminals, you know, because the criminals, they are held under the Palestinian Authority in these uh, Bantu stands throughout the West Bank. But and the both five, genders and all ages. 5,000, brother, 180 children yeah. under 18. 180 children are incarcerated. 43 women, 16 of them are moms. I mean, all these people are, and some, and some of these are horrible. Uh, conditions, very cruel conditions. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about, you know, uh, 30, 40 people in, in, a, in a single com uh, compartment where uh, they have no, uh, no protections. There are no masks. 
when they were asked, you know, one of the Israeli wardens in one of these prisons, he was basically saying, oh, you can put your own socks on your on your own uh, uh, mouth if 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 you have to uh, to protect yourself. So they're not given anything, and the four four prisoners actually got contracted uh, corona because of their interrogation. One of their interrogators was had the corona, and he he gave it to them. In another instance, even though the Israeli government uh, does not uh, 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 confirm this, uh, the, the you know some of the people who came from the inside recently has has, has told us that, and also we have other cases where the doctor himself. You know, in a clinic, when someone went there to to get some care on, a, on an unrelated matter, he contracted it in the clinic itself because the doctor had it, who was trying to take care of him. So it's it's miserable, and you don't get much care. You know, throughout the years, 67 Palestinians died uh, because of the ne medical negligence. Last year alone, five people died in Palestinian prisons because of medical negligence, and it's it's very cruel situation. Now they have been even though they didn't get much visitations or many rights, now it's even worse because they don't get any visitations, obviously, and that's understandable under a pandemic situation. But uh, their families are very worried and concerned. They're not getting the same phone calls or the same uh, contacts that they usually would uh, would be given in order to make sure that they are, you know, they are healthy and safe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um... And of course, I'm sure you saw that article, how um, they built this sort of uh, hospital, um, not a hospital, they built like a, a station to treat COVID patients in the West Bank and Israel destroyed that entire um, sort of makeshift clinic for people where, you know, they put up beds to kind of quarantine positive patients together. But I mean, even to treat sick people, I mean, you have the Hippocratic Oath and they wouldn't even... Yeah. You know, honor that, and they never do for Palestinians. But yeah. it was a it was a sad sight to see. Uh, you know, I often think, you know, that there there is the organization if Americans knew, <laughs> and Allison Weir, bless her heart, you know, she is a very committed soul. She has done phenomenal work through that organization. I uh, have nothing but a lot of, you know, respect for for her. But, you know, I often think of the name of that organization and, you know, the, the, the fact that we have uh, a large swath of people in the United States of America who do know, that who do hear about the, the, these these terrible um i mean it's 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 not hidden it's it's in the open especially given where we are today i mean we we've had we've had a succession of pro zionist governments in the united states i mean for for all of my years of activism there has been a succession of pro you know, uh, Zionist governments on the Democratic side, on the Republican side. But, you know, I mean, this one here that's in place now, it, it's just, it's it's taken, you know, pro-Zionism way off the rails and in many respects. And, and so there is an awareness uh, and, and a growing awareness. But you, you wonder to yourself, what is it going to take, you know, for us to, as a nation to come to a realization that there is a price paid for giving support to an apartheid regime like the one that occupies that land. There is a price that is paid for those who give that kind of support. And, and that price is, is felt on, many, on, on so many levels, so many levels. Um, subhanallah. Yeah. I think the tide is turning, though. I mean, I I like to stay optimistic, um, and I see that there's poll after poll that says that there's a shift with um, a larger number of Americans uh, expressing, cr you know, criticism of Israel of being, um, you know, more favorable towards the Palestinian narrative. Um, and I see that especially with younger generations. Um, you have lots of new groups, uh, if, um, what are they called, uh, if not now, 
of young American Jews who are continuously protesting against these injustices. Um, JVP, of course, is a big one. They have um, a lot of, uh, you know, big network uh, across the country where they're organizing constantly for Palestinian rights. Recently, um, launching a campaign to shed light on uh, what's happening to Palestinian prisoners. So, um, you know, I I like to think that with time, um, it's you know, it's it's no longer going to be popular to be pro-Israel because people see that this injustice, you can't escape it. And, um, you know, now it's linked with the Trump administration. So as ugly as it is, you can't both be extremely critical and anti-Trump, but then a hardline Zionist, you know, they're at this point one and the same. So, um, and even with, you know, Bernie Sanders and members of the Democratic Party who um, consistently uh, criticize Trump and Netanyahu's right-wing government, I think the more um, oppressive they are, the more, uh, you know, people just, enough is enough. They can't continue to support it blindly and they have to speak out. I mean, and we've seen that even with, um, you know, just uh, on social media, people who are notable figures commenting on Twitter about it. But I don't know if my dad has a different perspective. I that's, uh, that's just me. I, I like to remain optimistic that more people are, are increasingly against what's happening, and I don't know if that will lead to something, but I hope so. Well, if I may, uh, you, yes, know, you, you and I lived through the 80s during the last years of the apartheid regime, and I do believe, like uh, uh, what Lena said, is that if Americans get to know what's going on in the ground in Palestine, they will overwhelmingly, not everybody, but overwhelmingly, they will reject the oppression that is taking place uh, in their name. They have been uh, exposed to a massive brainwashing throughout the years, not only from the media and, and, and public officials and politicians and Hollywood and all that, but also in the education system and so on and so forth. But, but now with the with the new age of the social media and the globalization, it's very difficult to hide these things. You know, back in the 70s and 80s, people were getting their news from this, you know, half an hour at the end of the day at 6.30, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC, and that's about it. And then some few headlines from here and there. That's no longer the case. Uh, we've seen what happened when uh, many Americans were exposed to the horrors of apartheid. They stood up and they were able, it was the last country to join the, the struggle, but it was decisive at the end. And even Reagan, you know, the president at the time, they tried to, to prolong the 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 um, the life of apartheid. He wasn't able to, despite uh, his power and popularity. And I believe that in the next few years, we're going to see more of that. And that's why Netanyahu is basically racing with the support of Trump and other Zionists within this administration to try to grab as much land and as much uh, territory as as he could. And but that's not going to happen. I don't think. We're going to see any kind of political settlement because the the uh, the uh, the uh, what's called the two-state solution is dead, and we are now in a new phase of the struggle, and that phase would uh, would would ultimately bring to uh, Americans and the whole world to the issue of uh, would you be willing to sanction uh, a, a an apartheid, another apartheid in in the in the center of the earth, and I think that would be very difficult for many people to fathom or even to accept. And once that happens, once people start realizing that we are, what we have in Palestine today is another form that's even more brutal, even Nelson Mandela himself, uh, when he described it, and today we can hear it also in the words of his grandson, is that what's happening in Palestine is even worse than uh, yes. apartheid in South Africa. When people realize this, they're gonna, you know, basically reject it. And when that happens, I think the whole Zionist idea will crumble. And if Zionist institutions start crumbling and 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 uh, dismantle, I think there will be a whole new situation here. And I really believe that this is where 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 the trajectory. Even you cannot see it today, but I could see it in a few years that this whole project that has been built on deception and built on brutality and built on on violence and on on. Uh, 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 expropriation of land and so on and so forth, that cannot continue and I think uh, one day this will crumble 
and then we will see freedom for the Palestinians, and we're going to see peace in the Holy Land, and all those people who have been championing uh, this kind of uh, uh, aggression and this kind of brutality, uh, they, 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 they will see that this project is it cannot be maintained, that this project will eventually uh, go away. We are in the closing minutes, just uh, with couple of minutes, wow, of, of this uh, broadcast. Man, time flies when you're, when you're visiting with good folk, with good spirits. I, 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 I want to invite both of you to, um, to share any final thoughts on, on, on whatever you uh, would like to con conclude the broadcast with, but I have a, also a special request for you, uh, Brother Sammy. I know that you have had a strong feeling about our sister Afia Siddiqui for, for some time and and what she has been through. I mean, it's been, now been more than 17 years. And um, recently, we just, we just learned that a 30-year-old a Native American woman who was held at FMC Carswell, where Afia is, just died of COVID-19. She was pregnant, this young woman, she was pregnant. Um, she, was, she, had, she was under a two-year sentence. And um, uh, uh, subhanAllah, um, she, she ended up dying. And uh, the, her, I, I think her baby was, was delivered was before she died, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, but, yeah. but she died. And, and I just learned about another, uh, at least one other female prisoner was just released because of concern about COVID-19. But the thing about Afia Siddiqui is that her family has had no contact with her for the past two years. No contact whatsoever. I mean, she's under a special regime and, uh, you know, has all of us concerned. Uh, what, what are your thoughts, uh, Brother Sammy, on, on Afia? Sister Afia is one of the, is the face, really, of the so-called war and terror going going on. She has suffered so much, her family has suffered so much, and the facts are clear. She is innocent of all the charges that, That's right. she, that, 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 was, uh, uh, that she was given. And, and to be handed on top of that 86 years is, is, is just, it's not just a miscarriage of justice, it's just a total, total outrage. Uh, it's totally outrageous. So I'm really, I think it's enough is enough. I think the, the Pakistani government should stop, step up to the plate and ask for her repatriation. And I think the, the government uh, of the U.S., uh, after what, you know, what's going on now with the Taliban, uh, there's a peace process going on and there's, it is actually an admission and recognition of the Taliban. I think enough is enough. I think she should be tot immediately released to her family. And uh, that could be done legally. I mean, there is no need for any hoops here. Uh, uh, there is a treaty, and that treaty could be drawn up in no time. She could be taken to, to Pakistan, and, uh, and she could stay there, uh, even under house arrest if need be. But he, she needs to be reunited with her children that she has, hasn't seen in, in almost uh, 17, 18 years. She yeah. needs to be back to her family. And I think if people read about her case, uh, they will be, uh, it's heartbroken of what happened to this uh, sister whom, you know, we, we, we believe is, is uh, it's a sister who's totally innocent of all the charges and doesn't deserve any of that. I also want to want to conclude, if I may, uh, mm -hmm. that for any project to succeed, you know, in life, God gave us uh, a short span of life, and with that, we will be tested. And for anything to happen, uh, for uh, you know, that we need to be championing good causes and good organizations. We need a vision, we need a will, and we need action. And I think uh, an organization like yours, an organization like CCF and, and others, Cage in, in, in the UK, for example, they do have a vision and they do have a will. There are some committed brothers and sisters who want to do what is right and stand up and say truth to power. What they lack, uh, when it, not the action, but the, the resources needed to make that action happen. Mm -hmm. And for all our brothers and sisters who see these organizations and they wave and say nice words, that's not enough. What we need is we need real support and real financial support for these projects to actually come through and be fruitful. So I call through your program to all our brothers and sisters to start reaching out to these organizations and help them 
help them financially and help them by volunteering to them and by doing what is needed. That's the only way you can empower your community. That's the only way you can make a difference in the lives, not simply by watching programs and by giving uh, prayers and empty words. What we need is real action and real support. And this in the age of, of coronavirus and, and epidemic, we could see the challenges now are even greater than they've ever been. Uh, because you, you, you do not have the, the resources now to bring even people together. You have to do it online and you have to do it through reaching out from distance. So it, it, okay. it becomes even uh, uh, more difficult. But I'm still hopeful. I'm really hopeful that people now with this, they are going, you know, starting their eyes to be open and to see what's really important in life and not to be uh, deceived by those who would like to take advantage of our disunity, that our unity and our collective wisdom will come together in which we will be able, inshallah, to reach our goals. Thank you for this opportunity, brother. Alhamdulillah. My pleasure, my brother. So, Selena, any final thoughts from you? First of all, I also want to thank you so much, Jazakallah Khair, for having us on your program. And I just want to urge people to um, seek out organizations like the Afghan Foundation, like the Coalition for Civil Freedom. Uh, we have a website, civilfreedom.org, and our Facebook page, Coalition for Civil Freedom. Um, Subscribe to our email list, like our page to be um, updated on actions that, and you know programs that we're uh, leading now. We have the Coronavirus Prisoner Release Program. Um, our legal director is now filing compassionate release motions on behalf of 30 Muslim political prisoners who are uh, vulnerable to COVID-19. And I ask that people uh, support our work because we do this completely free of charge for the inmates um, and we've been reaching out to them. And, She's already appeared uh, in court for a few of them. So uh, please uh, support these prisoners. Don't forget them. Um, while we are family members who advocate, we can't do it alone. We need the community. And as the family of Sister Asya Siddiqui say, cases like this are not just a test for uh, the prisoners themselves, but for the community and how we're going to respond to this uh, crisis affecting us. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to talk about it. Uh, Thank you. Alhamdulillah, the pleasure is all mine. I want to thank you both, uh, Dr. Samuel Arian, Sister Lena Al Arian, uh, for your your commitment and uh, for taking out the time to be with us today. I want to thank uh, Salam Media for um, availing us of this platform for inviting their brother Salah Khan to be a part of their family, and uh, uh, we ask Allah Taala to to put. Uh, uh, to book baraka into these efforts that are being made um, information is power but only if that information is used if it is employed so we we invite those of you who listen to this uh, broadcast who saw it live as well as those who will see it later um, put the information that uh, you you acquire from these broadcasts uh, to good use um, and uh, to my muslim brothers and sisters uh, may Allah Ta'ala continue to bless us through this very unique struggle we're going through this in this uh, year's Ramadan. This is a very, very distinctive Ramadan. Uh, it is a Ramadan that is full of tremendous challenge, but that challenge also has a number of silver linings connected to it. May Allah Ta'ala bless us to avail ourselves of those silver linings and come out of this month you know, stronger mentally, physically, spiritually than we were when we began this spiritual journey. Thank you again, brother and sister. Thank you, uh, uh, listeners, uh, viewers. Uh, thank you, Salam Media. And to all of you, we say, Assalamu Alaikum. Peace be unto you. Thank you very much again.